Hello again, it's Mr. Kennedy. It is 5.50 in the evening on Tuesday the 14th, working a little bit overtime for you guys to make sure you get this video. Uh, today's topic is the American Revolution, and I'm going to try to keep it as clear cut and as easy to understand as possible because I know in the middle of summer, with being 100 degrees outside, you don't want to sit here and watch this. So I'm going to keep it short so that you at least stay interested. All right, I know I said American Revolution, but we're going to go back in time all the way to 1756. There's a war going on called the Seven Years War. Uh, you may have also heard it referred to as the French and Indian War. It's actually the same war. Uh, it's just depending on if you're looking at it from a European standpoint or if you're looking at it from an American standpoint. It lasts from 1756 to 1763. That's where you get the Seven Years' War from. Uh, it involves France, it involves England, Spain is going to be involved on it, or in it, I should say, and it is going to happen in North America, it's going to happen in the Caribbean, it's going to happen in Europe, even Asia. Now, this whole thing is going to happen because France and England are both claiming what is known as the Ohio country, which is really Western Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio, um, you know, they're basically fighting over like Cleveland, Canton, and Pittsburgh. France is going to build some forts to protect what they think is their territory. The English are going to send a little known guy named George Washington to raid these French outposts. In the end, Britain's going to declare war on France in 1756 once they learn that Washington is beaten by these French forces. So from 1757 to 1760, you have this combined British colonial force fighting against the French. And during this time, um, the war doesn't go very well for France. They lose all of their major outposts, all their major cities. And by 1763, France and their ally Spain are forced to give up the peace of Paris from 1763 is signed, and France has to give up claim to all of its major land holdings in North America. So for example, uh, Great Britain is going to get control of all the land between the Atlantic Ocean and the Mississippi River, and they're also going to get Canada. So a couple of impacts you should know. France is excluded from North America. France doesn't come back to North America, except for briefly during Napoleon times. Uh, the Native American tribes can no longer play the different European groups off of each other. And to prevent Native American uprisings and try to keep the colonists separate, the British are going to issue something known as the Proclamation of 1763. What does that do? It says no colonists can live on the inland side of the Appalachian Mountains. They have to live on the Atlantic side. Now, colonists get really mad about that. They say, you know what, we fought for that land, we died for this land, we should be able to live on that land, but the British government says absolutely not. To go even a step further, uh, since the war began in the colonies and much of the war was fought because of the colonists, Britain expected the colonists to pay for the war. The British Prime Minister Lord Grenville in 1763 decides to pass some taxes that will help pay off the war and these taxes are specifically for the colonists. You have the Sugar Act that is meant to tax sugar, meant to tax molasses and keep the colonists from doing business with other countries. And then you have the Currency Act that outlawed colonial paper money. The only money you could use were the hard British coins. So you tell the, the colonists you can't live in this new land, and then you tell the colonists, hey, you have to pay full price for your sugar. And then you say, hey, by the way, you can't use your paper money anymore. You have to use the British coins. We're going to make the colonists even more angry. And then at the same time, there's a group of people in Britain known as the Real Whigs. Real Whigs are worried that the government's gotten too powerful. They think that King George III is corrupt. And they say basically only the watchful eye of the public can keep 
the government on the straight and narrow. The only the watchful eye of the government can allow people to keep their freedoms and their liberties. Which, by the way, is basically exactly what the colonists wanted to hear at that moment. Then moving to 1765, the Stamp Act is passed, and that required a tax to be stamped on almost all printed materials. And I mean newspapers, pamphlets, wills, deeds, playing cards, licenses, like if you're a plumber and you need a license, you have to pay a tax. Uh, even for your loans, you have to pay a tax. And by the way, all that tax has to be paid in British coins, which the colonists don't have. People are really angry about that too. For example, James Otis Jr. goes in front of the Virginia House of Burgesses and he says taxation without representation is tyranny. You know that better today as no taxation without representation. Virginia declares the tax illegal, refuses to follow it. A group formed in New York City called the Sons of Liberty, uh, they're going to try and boycott all the British goods. And then there's a group called the Stamp Act Congress. It's a group of colonial leaders. They meet in October of 1765. They write a letter to Parliament that basically says, hey, this tax is unfair. If you don't repeal the tax, we're not going to buy in any of your stuff anymore. Well, that letter gets to Parliament. There's a new Prime Minister in town. His name is Lord Rockingham. And Lord Rockingham is going to repeal the Stamp Act, but he's going to replace it with something called the Declaratory Act. And the Declaratory Act, just to make it simple to understand, it said Parliament has the authority to do whatever it wants with the American colonies. Well, Lord Rockingham doesn't last very long. He's only in power for about a year. He's fired and King George III replaces Rockingham with William Pitt. William Pitt is going to appoint a new guy to head the treasury. The fancy British term for treasury is exchequer. So Charles Townsend is going to be the guy in charge of the money. Townsend is going to discover that more money is needed from the colonies to pay the seven years debt. And Townsend is going to come up with new and improved taxes to get the debts paid. And these taxes become known as the Townsend Acts. The Townsend Acts are going to put a, a tax on glass, paper, cloth, tea, basically you name it and it's going to get taxed. The city of Boston is unhappy with this. The city of Boston refuses to, to go along with it and you end up with the Boston Massacre because there's basically rebellion in Boston. After the Boston Massacre, that whole real Whig movement really catches on because the people in the colonies are starting to see the crown and the British government as being corrupt and evil. A couple more taxes are going to be passed, like the Tea Act, and as a result of the Tea Act, you're going to get the Boston Tea Party, where some people in Boston in the middle of the night uh, board a couple of ships and toss tea out into Boston Harbor. The end result of all this is that Boston is going to be placed under royal control. The Boston Harbor is going to be shut down and the government is going to declare martial law in Boston. 1774 in September, the first Continental Congress is going to meet in Philadelphia. It's going to be 55 delegates that represent the wealthy people from all 13 colonies. And they're going to write a letter called the Declaration of Rights and Grievances. And they declare that the colonists will obey a bona fide act of parliament. Basically, they'll agree with whatever parliament says only if they had a say in the decision. 
At the same time, one of the British commanding officers in Boston, his name is Thomas Gage, gets a letter that says, hey, there's a resistance brewing and in the city of Concord, there are weapons being distributed and collected and I think a fight's gonna happen. And Thomas Gage is ordered to go and arrest all the leaders of this, this resistance movement. On the way to Concord, the British army has to pass through the city of Lexington. And in the city of Lexington, there is a fight that breaks out. The British are going to fire at the American militia that has assembled. The American militia will run away. Uh, Thomas Gage gets to Concord, gets the weapons, and then turns around and marches back to Boston. What the British don't know is that by May 20th, there's something like 20,000 American militiamen stationed outside and around Boston just waiting to attack. The first true battle of the Revolutionary War is June 17th, 1775 at a place called Breed's Hill. The British are going to attack an American force. The American force repels the Redcoats twice, but when the Redcoats or the British attack the third time, the Americans are forced to retreat. So we're at war even before the Declaration of Independence. Now in May of 1776, the Second Continental Congress is going to meet. Uh, they're going to agree to print $2 million in paper money. And of course, that paper money is in many ways worthless. They're going to appoint General George Washington to be the commander in chief of the army. And they're still going to try and find peace while they're doing this. They write what's known as the Olive Branch Petition. They confess loyalty to King George III. They beg him, please take us back. Let's find peace. And it explains why the colonists were fighting. Basically, we're defending our rights and the rights that we think we're supposed to have as Englishmen. When King George III gets this letter, uh, it makes him really angry and he tells the government of Britain and he tells the army of Britain, treat the colonists like open and avowed enemies. So our peace offering is completely rejected and there's no choice but war. Now, as you see here, it says not everyone supported the war. Two out of every five people were rebels. One out of every five people were loyalists. Nobody has a majority. The other two out of five are neutral. It's they, they're the ones that are going to be swayed one way or the other. And if you want to know really the one person who makes the American Revolution happen, it's a little known guy named Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine, he was one of those real Whig believers. He had just recently moved to the colonies and he writes a pamphlet. It's about a 30 page pamphlet called Common Sense. Um, common Sense is written in a way that the, the regular people of the day would be able to understand it. Uh, common Sense was written in a way that people would take seriously. And Common Sense, uh, Thomas Paine uses many different points of view. He uses a religious argument, a financial argument, a military argument, a legal argument, a biblical argument, and it all just boils down to say, hey, we have to get rid of the British. We need to be our own country. So little by little, the rebels start to gain support and it comes a point, basically a tipping point where there's no way out of it. The king has already said, you're done for, and now it's just time to convince the people that you know, we need to fight for our rights. As far as strategy goes, once again, not really a, a military history class, so I'm not going to bore you too much with super detailed stuff. But as it says here, the British strategy, they're going to treat this like any other war that they would see in Europe. Let's take control of the cities. Let's have a clear military victory, crush the opposing army, and we'll win. But the Americans, they realize 
that this is a war of thought, a war of heart, a war of ideas. So all we need to do is outlast the British. The British will wear out. The British people will get tired of fighting. The British people will get tired of paying for the war. And eventually, the British will be forced to surrender. There's lots of fighting in the American Revolution. Um, just in South Carolina alone, there are over 200 battles. Now notice here, I don't have 200 battles for you. Really, I think these are the five, six that you should know. Like for example, um, the very first battle, the battle for Long Island, it is a defeat for George Washington. George Washington tries to defend Long Island, which is a very long island, it's in the name. But the British have the strongest navy, and the British basically back their ships up to the beach and just pound it with their cannon. George Washington is forced to retreat, and he retreats all the way to New Jersey. When we get to the Battle of Trenton, which is December of 1776, Washington is going to capture a group of Germans known as Hessians. Uh, the Hessians had celebrated Christmas a little bit too hard, if you get what I mean. And they weren't completely sober. And George Washington is going to have his troops surprise the Hessian people and capture them all. And this is going to boost morale. And for the first time, the American colonists are like, hey, we can win this. Uh, you got the Saratoga campaign. Uh, the British Army is going to try and march out of Montreal in Canada and come down to New York City and split the colonies in two. Uh, so the British are going to move out of Quebec. They're going to go down to Lake Champlain. Then from Lake Champlain, they're going to go to the Hudson River, and they're going to start marching south. And at first, the strategy works, but the further away from Montreal and Quebec, that the British got, the longer their supply lines were, and their supply line got vulnerable. So the American army, led by a guy named Nathaniel Green, start to attack the British supply lines, and the British are forced to retreat. Valley Forge, uh, this is where the American military spent the winter of 1777 and 1778. It's not a battle, but it is a really big turning point in the war. When George Washington, well, first of all, um, in the 1700s and before, war was not a year-round thing. When it got too cold to fight, you stopped fighting. And Valley Forge, which is in Pennsylvania, is where George Washington decided to winter his troops. He asked for supplies to be delivered to Valley Forge. Um, unfortunately, they weren't. So when George Washington gets to Valley Forge, nothing is ready, nothing is there, no supplies. So there's starvation, there's disease, there's malnutrition, there's exposure to frostbite. Something like 2,500 or 3,000 soldiers die. Well, why does he go there? It's an easily defensible position. It was going to give Washington a chance to give his men a rest. And it ends up being that Washington is going to be able to train his men how to fight there. A German guy named Baron von Steuben is going to come from Prussia. That's spelled Russia with a P in front of it, Prussia. And he's going to offer to train Washington's army. So Washington's army goes from basically a bunch of farmers to gu with guns to a true professional army trained in the German way of war. Once the Saratoga campaign is over and once it becomes obvious that Washington's army is now a professional army, France is going to get involved, France is going to have our back, and France is going to help us win the war. Now, what about Yorktown? Uh, Lord Cornwallis, who is the leader of one of the British forces, he's going to go to Yorktown, which is in Virginia, to be resupplied. Um, it's going to be, it's a peninsula, it's next to the water, the British have the strongest navy, so Cornwallis thinks he's going to be safe. What he doesn't realize is that George Washington and an American French army have surrounded him on the land side. And then on the water side, the French Navy has come up and surprised him on the back. Cornwallis ends up being surrendered. And you end up with like 20,000 American and French versus about 10,000 British. 
Cornwallis decides that the situation can't be won. He's forced to surrender. He waves the white flag and negotiations commence. After a tough negotiation, Cornwallis and the British army is forced to surrender to the American army October 7th, 1781. Now this was never supposed to be the last battle. The British army could have continued on, but that whole outlast thing, by 1781, the British people were pretty tired of fighting. So the war is going to end with the Treaty of Paris, 1783. And just to kind of, I know there's a lot here, there's a lot you can read, but I think really number one is the most important thing. Uh, the United States is gonna be a free, sovereign, and independent nation. All crown claims are renounced. All right, so that is part one, just steaming right on through here. Um, so the United States is gonna be a independent country. 1781, the United States is independent. But what a lot of people may not realize is that the American government had been forming during the entire war. Uh, the first place that the American government is really gonna get it started is on the state level. The colonies realize, hey, if we win, uh, we have to do something about it. We have to have some sort of government ready to go. So constitutions are gonna be written. All of the governments are gonna look pretty similar. It's gonna be a really strong legislature, a really weak governor. And the, the judiciary branch, the legal system is gonna be independent. There are going to be limits on government authority. These first states are going to pass a Bill of Rights. So they're going to get freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, right to a fair trial, all that stuff. Now, it becomes very obvious that there are some problems. The weak executive means the action is slow. The legislature has to act first. People have to agree. And you put 10 people in a room and say, where should we have lunch? Nobody's going to have, it's going to take a while to make an agreement. So just imagine. Who should we tax? What should we tax? Things like that. It's a real kerfluffle. So in the end, the powers of the governor are increased. State constitutions are rewritten over and over and over again. It's not really until the early 1800s that a lot of these state governments stabilize and begin to function much like they do today. What about the federal government, the national government? Well, in 1777, the Second Continental Congress is going to draft the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation is going to, it's going to create a government where there's only one house in the legislature, one representative from each of the 13 colonies, no executives, and everybody has to agree. Unanimous decisions. Another thing is that the powers given to the national government were extremely limited. This national government could settle disputes between states, it could regulate foreign trade, it could set the value of currency, uh, except it really couldn't because as written, it had no power to raise taxes, it has no power to raise money, and it had no power to enforce any decisions it made. So even if all 13 states agreed on something, if one of the states later decided, no, nah, I'm not gonna do that, there's nothing this federal government could do. Another big difference is that each state was going to be an independent nation. Each state remained sovereign, meaning each state maintained its independence, but it was gonna to work together much like the European Union works together today. So for today, there is a European Union government, but each of the, the countries that make up the European Union they're all independent. So it was gonna be really very, very different than what we have today. As it says here, the Articles of Confederation were very weak. They're not even approved until 1780 because Maryland said, yeah, we'll do this. And in the end, they refused to sign. As far as the actual governing goes, each state handled Native Americans differently. Each state hand handled the uh, loyalists differently. Each state handled foreign affairs differently and it was a complete mess. If you wanna know of any positives that really come out of the Articles of Confederation, like lasting positives, it's a Northwest Ordinance of 1787. 
it set up the Northwest Territories, which today are Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, uh, that part of the country. And they said the Northwest Territory will never have slavery. The Northwest Territory will have a Bill of Rights. And once these little baby territories grow up to be adult states, they will be equal to every state that came before them. So that's the Northwest Ordinance, and really, that's like the success of the Articles of Confederation. It became obvious that the Articles of Confederation didn't work as written, and in 1786, members from five states are going to meet and try and discuss how do we improve this. Problem is, you need to have 13 states there, so you can't do anything with just five states. They decide, you know what, let's just go home. Let's try again next year, and we'll see if more people show up. Eh. Between that meeting and the next meeting, there's an event that happens called Shays Rebellion. This guy named Daniel Shea is going to lead about 1,000 to 1,500 farmers in a revolt in Massachusetts against the Massachusetts government. And it's all because the farmers can't pay off their debts and the government doesn't help them. Now, in the end, Shays' Rebellion is a failure, but it scares people. And when it becomes time for that next meeting in February of 1787, uh, it's in everybody's mind. And when the people meet in February of 1787, uh, you have representatives from 12 of the 13 states. Now, 12 is still less than 13, so they have to decide, well, what are we going to do? Uh, Rhode Island decided it wasn't important enough to show up. Well, they decide to go ahead and keep meeting. They decide, you know what, we're going to get something done. And 55 men from 12 different states meet. These are all middle-aged men. The oldest one is Ben Franklin, who's in his 70s. The youngest one, I think, was actually Alexander Hamilton, which was like 19. And... They're wealthy, they're educated, um, they're going to decide, hey, we need to do some work. They decide that the idea of being a republic is the best way to go. And two plans are going to be presented. One's called the Virginia Plan, one is called the New Jersey Plan. In the Virginia Plan, it's going to favor uh, states that have a lot of people. It's going to be population-based. The bigger your population, the more power you have. There's going to be two houses in government, a lower house and an upper house. The people will elect the lower house, the lower house will elect the upper house, and then the lower house and the upper house together will select the executive, the president. The smaller states don't like that because they know Virginia, Massachusetts, and New York will control everything. So New Jersey comes up with their own plan, and it's basically, hey, the Articles of Confederation work. Let's just give the government more power over trade and more power over taxation. We'll keep all the representation equal, everybody will have one vote, and we'll go along just like we have been. Nobody can agree one way or the other, and so the representatives from Connecticut come up with what is now known as the Connecticut Plan or the Great Compromise. And that's the system we have today. Two houses, one house based on population, one house based on equal representation, and there's the election of the president, and the rest is history. Constitution will be sent out September 87. Uh, they have to deal with this too because they know not everybody's going to sign it. So they decide, you know what, instead of having unanimous consent, let's just say two-thirds consent, which meant if nine out of the 13 states approved it, it would go into effect. And wouldn't you know, by June of 1788, nine out of 13 states ratify it. The four, I know you're just dying to know, but yeah, the four that don't sign are Virginia, New York, Rhode Island, and North Carolina. In New York and somewhat in Rhode Island, you get two different opposing views. You get the Federalist view versus the Anti-Federalist view. The Federalists are pro-Constitution. 
They're usually wealthy, upper to middle class. They want a strong central government, and they write a set of papers trying to convince people that they are correct, called the Federalist Papers. On the other side are a group known as the Anti-Federalists. Uh, some of them are fairly wealthy, but generally speaking, uh, they're small farmers or people out in the frontier. They believe in individual liberty. They believe in individual rights, and they want a bill of rights to be written into the Constitution before they will support it. Now, why was there not a guaranteed bill of rights in the original Constitution? Well, it's because the framers of the Constitution, the ones who wrote it, said each of these states have their own Bill of Rights already, we don't need to duplicate the work. But some people in the Anti-Federalist camp said, no, you absolutely have to include a Bill of Rights. The Anti-Federalist did write the Anti-Federalist Papers. Uh, the the Anti-Federalist Papers have been preserved mostly, um, but they are not as widely read, they're not as well received. It's very obvious very quickly that the Federalists are going to win this argument. Eventually, the four holdouts do sign, but not until the Bill of Rights is added to the Constitution as the first 10 amendments. All right, I'm a little over 30 minutes Sorry about that, I made it as fast as I could. If you have any questions about anything or if there's anything you want to know more about, send me an email. Um, I'll be in my office all day Wednesday the 15th, all day Thursday the, 5th, the 16th. And um, you know, I'll be glad to entertain any questions you may have or any comments you may have. But until then, I'll end the video. I'll wish you a good week. Uh, I don't know when you'll watch this, of course, so whenever it is, I hope you're having a good day and I hope you have a good week. And we'll talk to you on next Tuesday. See you later.